We have a Second Amendment federal court loss. This one's relating to that, if you remember this, the New Mexico Emergency Public Health Order, the PHO. What happened here? It all goes back to sensitive locations, sensitive locations, sensitive locations. Not quite what they say in real estate, but close enough for government work here, which is exactly what we're gonna be exploring. So guys, let's get into it. So let's remember what we're talking about here. We're of course talking about the New Mexico Public Health Order, the PHO that was ordered by the New Mexico governor that broadly disabled, discouraged, you know, effectively made illegal the possession and carrying of firearms across all sorts of different public areas. They had to amend the order for various reasons, largely relating to, you know, constitutionality and other concerns. So this is what they came up with. And this is just kind of a paraphrased version. So it now reads, quote, no person other than law enforcement and so forth shall possess a firearm either openly or concealed in public parks, or playgrounds or other public areas provided for children to play in. So you can see that they very closely tied everything in to where children play. Now, here's the too long, don't want to watch version. So the court's going to wind up denying the preliminary injunction. Let's recall that generally speaking, when you sue the government, there's two opportunities for injunction. You have the temporary injunction. That's basically issued on the outset of a case. Plaintiffs invariably ask for it. Plaintiffs in our case being the pro second amendment groups like Firearms Policy Coalition, Second Amendment Foundation, both fantastic groups worthy of your membership. So you move for that. And then that's typically ruled on a very limited evidentiary basis. So neither side has a huge opportunity to brief that. And then following the court's order on that, you have where we are here, which is the preliminary injunction. So this is the one, again, that's going to preliminary injunction. We're going to determine whether or not the law or regulation is allowed to stand while the lawsuit's being litigated, which could take weeks, months, or maybe even longer. Whereas the temporary order is basically, is the injunction going to be allowed to stand until we get to the hearing for the preliminary injunction? So the temporary injunction tends to last a matter of weeks, maybe a month, give or take. Whereas the preliminary injunction, that's what basically perhaps stays the execution and issuance of the regulation, or in our case, the public health order throughout the pendency of the litigation itself. So the judge winds up denying the plaintiff's motion for the injunction, meaning the PHO, the public health order, is in effect, is in effect in these places. It's the amended one. So how did we get here? Well, Look, there's going to be the long form version linked in my whole video about sensitive places analysis at the end of this video on the outro screen. So be sure to catch that video there if you really want the deep, deep dive. But for now, we're going to be kind of going through the poor man's version. So we're talking about sensitive places. This is where the U.S. Supreme Court has explicitly blessed the concept that the government may prohibit and criminalize the possession of firearms in certain locations. Now, this is not to be confused with non-sensitive locations, such as private property, like a mall or something like that, where to every state that I'm aware of off the top of my head, private property owners can always reserve the right to deny people access or to deny the possession of firearms on private property, whether that's a home, a mall, a restaurant, something like that. Now, the penalties if you violate that may be different in different states. Some states, there may be virtually no penalties. Other states, that, that may be felony penalties. So that's what varies. But again, that's going to be up to the private property holder in that particular location. Here we're talking about sensitive locations, sensitive places. These are things that the government has decided we're throwing the kill switch on whether or not you can possess weapons here. So the Bruin Court decision, that's the US Supreme Court from June of 2022, came out and among the very important things that they, that they laid out in that decision is they said, look, we are basically again blessing the concept of sensitive locations. And here's an example of these. Number one, certain government buildings, such as legislative assemblies or courthouses, or where the government is acting within the heartland of its authority. Their words, not mine. Two, polling places, places where you vote. And three, schools. 
Brune Court went on to instruct future courts to consider analogies to such sensitive locations when considering whether the government can meet its burden of saying, look, a similar ban is going to be appropriate. That's where we're going to be going into here. But there's going to be a sleight of hand that the government and the judge is going to wind up pulling that we're starting to see as far as a nationwide historical trend, because now it's not only been one case where this has happened, but now we have two cases where basically the anti-gunners are trying to move the goalposts on not just the Second Amendment, but another amendment, and it's going to be tied into how they take guns away from you. So be sure to stick around because we're going to get to that. So how is this public health order? How is any law going to be deemed to be constitutional? Well, there's going to be kind of a two ways of looking at this, I think. Number one is going to be whether or not it can be analogous, as we just discussed, to one of the explicit locations discussed by the U.S. Supreme Court in Brune. So for instance, is a playground similar enough to a school? Another thing, and closely tied to that, is whether or not there is enough of a historical tradition within our nation's regulation of the Second Amendment laws tying up and binding the Second Amendment in order to say, look, this actually comes from our nation's historical tradition. So there's potentially two paths to the end zone here, so to speak, in order for the government and the court, for that matter, to find this public health order constitutional. Let's take a look at what they did. So there are six historical examples coming from Texas, Missouri, Arizona, Oklahoma, as well as four different city ordinances from New York City, Philadelphia, St. Paul, and Detroit, as well as ordinances from four additional cities, Chicago, Salt Lake, as well as St. Louis and Pittsburgh, between different times and different places doing slightly different things. The full list of that would be in the description box below, so you're not just watching me read a list. And the court's going to basically go through and start picking those apart. Now, of course, to the extent that laws come from territories, and this comes from the Supreme Court and other courts. So the New Mexico court basically copied and pasted a lot of the discussion from another court that took place called the Antonyak decision, which I've covered before actually on this channel, but that one came from New York. And I think in a lot of ways has laid a lot of the groundwork for how a lot of courts and judges are going to be looking at this. It was very methodical as far as how they worked through the New York law, what's constitutional, what isn't, ball, strike, all that kind of good stuff. So basically they covered and sampled, they copied and pasted the particular portions and adopted a lot of that reasoning that dealt with explicitly the parks and playgrounds. So let's take a look at some of that here. Remember what Bruin said, not all history is created equal. We cannot give equal weight to all history of different regulations and laws. Here's an example of that. Laws that come from territories, the courts have said, look, the court affords those little weight. The U.S. Supreme Court observed in the Bruin decision that finding that statutes of territories deserve little weight because they were localized and they were rarely subject to judicial scrutiny. Plus, they were inherently short-lived because, of course, all these territories that we're discussing about back in the 19th century transitioned to statehood. So that knocks out Salt Lake City in 1888, Arizona in 1889, as well as the Oklahoma law in 1890. Similarly, to the extent that the laws come from the last decade of the 19th century, i.e. we're specifically singling out the 1893 Pittsburgh law as well as the 1895 Detroit law, the court discounts their weight because of their diminished ability to shed light on the public understanding of the Second Amendment, which was passed back in 1791, as well as the 14th Amendment. You're starting to see this, this paradigm shift now all of a sudden. When the 14th Amendment was passed back in 1868. Now, this is something that came from basically, in part, the Brune decision, where, quote, historical evidence that long predates or postdates either 1791 or 1868 may not illuminate the scope of the right. So you're starting to see the argument build that, look, this isn't just about when the Second Amendment was passed in 1791. We need to now also look at things that come from the era of when the 14th Amendment was passed in 1868. So we all know what the Second Amendment does. We're talking about codifying a pre-existing right for individuals to be armed, for individuals to basically act in self-preservation. The 14th Amendment, for those of you who may be a little bit out beyond your eighth grade civics class, we're talking about basically incorporating the other amendments in the Bill of Rights to also serve as a check against state power. So for instance, until 1868, None of the Bill of Rights actually restrained state and local government. 
they only functioned as a check on federal government. So that's going to be important to remember here. And you're starting to see the expansion of the scope of laws and regulations that suddenly courts may consider. See the goalposts moving? Moreover, the courts can discount going on the weight of the city laws to the extent that they are not accompanied by laws from states that are sufficiently similar in nature. So when we're talking about public parks, for instance, are public parks coming from, hey, we're banning all the public parks from having possession in a particular state or only something like New York City or Philadelphia or something like that. So you can see that there's a difference between, hey, in highly populated, dense urban areas in the country, those particular city parks are going to be face restrictions on firearm rights as opposed to, nope, the entire state of New York back in the 19th century prohibited the possession of firearms in parks, which, by the way, to my knowledge, they did not. Because we have to keep in mind that the bare existence of these localized restrictions cannot overcome the overwhelming evidence of an otherwise enduring American tradition permitting public carry. That comes from the Bruin decision. And also keep in mind that just because a few cities, again, did something a few times across the breadth of American history, does not mean that it falls squarely within the American tradition of regulating and restricting firearms in the Second Amendment. Just because we can cherry pick a few outliers, because there's always a few, that does not mean that, hey, that falls within the American tradition, therefore we can now do it to the entire country, because a couple cities did it at a particular point in time. So what are we left with, basically, when we kind of go through the cutting room floor? Well, the remainder of the laws in support of whether these particular laws fall within the American tradition, i.e. the 1870 Texas law, the 1883 Missouri law, and somewhat to a lesser extent, the 1861 New York City law, the 1868 Philadelphia City law, the 1881 Chicago law, the 1883 St. Louis law, and the 1888 St. Paul law. That's pretty much what we largely have left. Now, at the time of the passage of these laws, the court observes, these densely populated cities combined for approximately 6.8% of the American population, with New York City contributing about 2.4% of that by itself. So there's a fair question that while, again, the varied nature of their geographic origins, we're talking about different cities from around the country, makes these type of laws somewhat established, again, let's face it, we're talking about 6.8% of the people being affected. Is that truly representative of what the nation and the nation's historical tradition is as a whole? The court would basically say no. However, at least where it comes down to playgrounds, the court in the New York case ruled that since adults are not very likely to go to playgrounds unless supervising children, that the idea of prohibiting firearms at playgrounds is at least analogous to the concept of prohibiting firearms in schools. Yes, I know. I want to protect my kids at playgrounds too. But again, the Supreme Court in Bruin left the door open to directly analogous laws to the sensitive categories that were basically blessed, and that included prohibitions in schools. So this is not me being an advocate. This is me being a reporter and an educator explaining, here's how the court did this. Here's how the court connected these dots. Now, parks can be a little bit of a different analysis, and we're going to see again that moving goalpost because this is where the court once more brings up the 14th Amendment issue. In the New York case, we're talking the Antonyuk case, the court noted that this arguably supported the historical tradition of banning farms and public parks in cities because, hey, we're looking at 1868. That's when this all comes through. All this, all these public park bans from the 1860s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, that's all close to 1868. However, we're only talking about 6.8% and we're only talking about public parks inside major, major cities. There's a major distinction there. Before we go any further, if you're enjoying this, be sure to hit that like button as well as be sure to stick around for the quote of the day. I look forward to seeing and joining you in the discussion in the comment field below after the video. So the court in, in the New Mexico case also pulled in another court called the Maryland Shall Issue Decision, where there the district trial court, so by no means controlling or precedential, we call this persuasive, when a court cites another court because, hey, we're dealing with pretty analogous and direct and similar issues, but that court doesn't have direct control over us. We don't fall inside that court's chain of command. So we call that persuasive evidence. And basically the New Mexico court citing this Maryland Shall Issue court is saying, Look, the trial court in that case reasoned that the Second Amendment did not really come into being in a certain sense as a restriction on state power until 1868. That's when the 14th Amendment came through. So at least when we're talking about parks, we have to really look to park laws around that time. And we can see that 
in many different cities, as we already talked about, plus three states now. By the end of the 19th century, Minnesota, North Carolina, and Wisconsin all had prohibitions of possession of firearms in parks, at least according to the Maryland shell issue case. So let's put all the pieces together. If we put this all together, you can see where the judge wound up going with this. The court in essence ruled that playgrounds are analogous to schools, similar to how the judge in the Antonyak case in New York did that. And parks are both analogous, not only because we've got the tied in children issue, but also they're common enough by the time we've got the passage of the 14th amendment that implicitly, although the judge may not have explicitly said it, implicitly I'll take that leap and say, look, this was common enough in this judge's eyes. Now, the judge was careful to, of course, leave the door open to reversing themselves later, but for now, it is not clear that the plaintiffs met their burden for showing that they're likely to succeed on the merits and therefore they cannot secure the preliminary injunction. The court went on to say, quote, the court finds that the recognition of what constitutes a sensitive place could very well be determined by the type of function occurring at those locations, as well as whether a vulnerable population, such as children, utilize such locations, end quote. I will also just note for you really quickly that there were two separate cases, one coming out of Illinois in 2018, as well as one coming out of the Delaware Supreme Court that both struck down bans on possession of firearms in Illinois. It dealt with the fact that there were 600 parks in Chicago, and I believe Illinois also banned off the top of my head possession within a thousand feet of those parks, which effectively would turn the entire city of Chicago into a sensitive location, which of course was the idea if we're being honest. And likewise in Delaware, where the court found that under the Delaware's constitution, interesting that despite it being a 2017 case, post when the second amendment was incorporated into applying against the states out of the McDonald versus City Chicago decision in 2010, the Delaware Supreme Court relied on the Delaware's constitution where they said that state's designation of public parks as a gun-free zone did not just infringe, but destroyed the core right of self-defense for ordinary citizens. Maybe if they included the words where children congregate, the courts would have had that extra, hmm, now we've got the loophole to attack the second amendment. We'll see where this all goes. Hopefully it's gonna wind up being appealed. We'll follow this if you guys want us to stay on top of it. Let us know that by hitting the like button and commenting below. Our quote of the day comes from the ancient Greek philosopher Epictetus. Quote, man is not affected by events, but by the view he takes of them, end quote. Look forward to seeing the comment fields. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content and we'll see you in the next one.